Yeah. It's true, and as you talk about sentencing, Alice, we can bring our next guest who can give us some more context on all of this from a legal standpoint. Dina Dahl, an attorney with uh, Dina Dahl LLP. Thank you so much for being with us, Dina. Um, we just want to speak now about the case. Uh, the verdict came back quickly. Uh, what did you see and what did you hear and what did you expect from this case and this verdict? Yeah, I've been following this case since jury selection, and I was not surprised at the quick verdict because the prosecution showed overwhelming evidence of not only the unreasonableness of the force, but also the cause of death. And I think that's what we saw here with just the 11 hours of deliberation guilty on all counts. And, and what does it mean that, in fact, if he's found guilty on all counts, how will that translate into sentencing when that happens? We are going to be having a sentencing hearing in about two, two months, and we will know then the details. But each of the three counts carries a maximum different sentence. Second degree murder, 40 years. The third degree murder has 25 years. And the manslaughter has 10. But this is the maximum. And this being his first offense, he could get as low as 12 and a half years. The prosecution is asking for a longer sentence due to some aggravating factors, including the fact that there were minors present. That was why they put on a nine-year-old witness testifying to her watching right. the murder. There was also the fact that he was a police officer and so had more of a duty of care. We're going to hear, hear all of that, and the judge will decide in about two months. Right. Those aggravating factors were called Blakely factors. Dina, thanks so much for giving us that perspective. Right now, we can go now to Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. We can speak now, actually, with Dina Dahl, who's still with us. Uh, Dina Dahl, legal analyst and attorney. Thank you for being with us, Dina. Uh, we were just speaking about sentencing and we were talking about aggravating factors just before we heard from Reverend Sharpton. Just going a little further on that, what you think we might see, because we know these aggravating factors may mean that the judge could extend the sentence beyond the 40 years prescribed by Minnesota law. What do you expect? As I was saying, there's three things that the prosecution is going to argue. One, it was done in the presence of minors. One, that he was in a police officer and should have had more of a duty of care toward him. And that he was unusually cruel in it. I do think that they will take into consideration the judge. But this judge has been very hard to read throughout the whole trial. I imagine we might find it something less than the 40 years and more than the 12 and a half years. I actually don't know if he will receive the full 40 years based on the fact that this will be his first time offense. And that is going to also weigh heavily with the judge. Dina, of course, this is uh, tragically not the only instance of uh, police violence that has led to death. Of course, there was just the incident that happened so close to the courthouse where this trial took place. Do you feel like today's verdict might have a, a ripple effect on future cases and or a, a kind of a, a retroactive effect on other instances where police have uh, killed men and women throughout this country, including, of course, here in Southern California. I think what this shows is that a police officer can be convicted if he or she causes the death of somebody while in their care. We have seen over and over this not to be the case. And so DAs have been reluctant to bring charges that they think they cannot get a conviction of. We see now that they were able to get a conviction, and it's possible that means that they will be more likely to bring charges. DAs don't really want to bring charges unless they think they have the evidence to convict. It's interesting because the jury here was fairly young, whether or not that was because of COVID or other factors. And so you might also think that these younger generation may also be more likely to see convict people who are and authorities such as police officers. That's a little too early to tell. Uh, Dina, Alex asked an important question. What aspect of this could be precedent in a positive way for future prosecutions of police officers who might be, in fact, guilty of these sorts of crimes? But what do you think, on the other end, were the outliers that make this case uh, not really good for precedential value? Maybe it was the nature of the videotape or whatever else. What might you speak to there that feels like it was not a precedential value? You know, at the end of the day, if when you look at this as just a criminal case, not a political case in any way, there was so much evidence, much more evidence than you would typically have in a criminal trial. There was not only one 
videotape, but there were several from multiple angles. That's very unusual. So it's very easy for the prosecutor to prove that there was this intentional assault, which is all they had to prove. I mean, he still had the knee on the neck even when the paramedic was checking his pulse. That type of overwhelming evidence is unusual in any type of criminal case. And that could be why that although here they were able to obtain a conviction, they may not always necessarily be able to do so even in future police cases. Dean, I want to rewind a little bit because uh, it's important to note here uh, yet another way in which Southern California has uh, had ties to the situation there in Minneapolis. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, as you may well know, uh, visited to the area last weekend and she made some remarks there to the public. She then made some remarks to uh, reporters who were there. There was a bit of a game of operator and an echo chamber that followed out of that. And next thing you know, there's the whole political, as you mentioned, situation that has played out in Congress today that maybe we'll be able to talk to in a moment. But we also, was quite extraordinary, uh, heard the judge taking a stance around what Maxine Waters had said. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that did that strike you at all as, as remarkable in any way? You know, there were several times here that the press kind of interfered according to the defense in the trial. And the judge at every stance continued to keep the trial going. The first time was when the settlement came out. The second time was Dante Wright's killings and the protests around that. And then the third time was this statement by Maxine Waters. And every time the defense said that this has unfairly tainted the jury pool, the judge decided that that was not the case. The first time with the settlement, they hadn't been finished seating the jury, so he did question them on that. The other two, he did not question them on that. We will see this on appeal by the defense as an issue, for sure. Yeah, that becomes grounds for possible appeals, a judge mentioned. Dina, let's go back also now to, to what how this uh, case was different and could be of interesting presidential value for jurisdictions around the country. We know that in, in Minnesota, there is a doctrine called the Spark of Life uh, Doctrine, which came out of a 1985 state case that essentially said in this sort of case, unlike many other states, California included, you could hear testimony testifying to the kind of man, the spark of life of George Floyd. He was not just flesh and bones, but a spark of life is what this case actually held. So we don't see that in other jurisdictions. People are making a lot of conversation around this because it did bring humanity to George Floyd. Do you think that that spark of life testimony was uh, part of this verdict coming down so quickly and the way that it did? And do you think that perhaps we see this ag agitated for in other jurisdictions around the country after this case? You know, I don't think it made that much of a difference, again, because of the video. And we heard George Floyd beg for his life. And that gave enough humanity to his death that I don't think the jurors actually needed a spark of life testimony. What's fascinating is how little the defense tried to humanize the defendant. We heard virtually nothing about the kind of person he was. They probably did that because they didn't want to open up the door to other questioning. But still, that's highly unusual that they did not try to humanize the defend defendant. And, and so, Dina, when you think about uh, the possibility of appeals, what could potentially happen from this point out? Because it feels like today a certain chapter has closed, but how firm is that closing? A defendant will always appeal in a conviction, and there will be several grounds to it. The most likely ones will be this media and whether or not it did interfere with the jurors. They were told not to listen to the news, but they were never questioned as to whether or not they inadvertently heard it and whether or not that tainted them. It's possible we might hear from some of the jurors themselves. They may speak out in the media. We might glean some information prior to any formal appeal, but we can very well see those issues as probably their strongest arguments. It would be appeal. interesting to hear those jury deliberations. They are always so mysterious. Dina, thank you so much for your perspective and your legal insight today. Dina Dahl, legal analyst and attorney. Thank you, Dina.